Good afternoon and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Decker's Brands first quarter fiscal 2025 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be provided at that time for you to queue up for questions. If anyone has any difficulties hearing the conference call, please press star zero for operator assistance at any time. I would like to remind everyone that this conference call is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Aaron Kohler, Vice President, Investor Relations and Corporate Planning. Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us today. On the call is Dave Powers, President and Chief Executive Officer, Steve Foshing, Chief Financial Officer, and Stefano Carodi, our Chief Commercial Officer and incoming CEO. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone of the company's safe harbor policy. Please note that certain statements made on this call are forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws, which are subject to considerable risks and uncertainties. These forward-looking statements are intended to qualify for the safe harbor from liability established by the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. All statements made on this call today, other than statements of historical fact, are forward-looking statements and include statements regarding our current and long-term strategic objectives, capital allocation, anticipated impacts from our brand and marketplace management strategies, changes in consumer behavior, strength and performance of our brands, demand for our products, product and channel distribution strategies, including DTC, marketing plans and strategies, disruptions to our supply chain and logistics, our anticipated revenues, product mix, margins, expenses, inventory levels, and promotional activity, the impacts of the macroeconomic environment on our operations and performance, including fluctuations in foreign currency exchange rates, our ability to achieve our financial outlook, and the expected timing and impact of the planned leadership transition. Forward-looking statements made on this call represent management's current expectations and are based on the information available at the time such statements are made. Forward-looking statements involve numerous known and unknown risks, uncertainties, and other factors that may cause our actual results to differ materially from any results predicted, assumed, or implied by the forward-looking statements. The company has explained some of these risks and uncertainties in its SEC filings, including in the risk factor section of its annual report on Form 10-K and quarterly reports on Form 10-Q. Except as required by law or the listing rules of the New York Stock Exchange, the company expressly disclaims any intent or obligation to update any forward-looking statements. On this call, management may refer to financial measures that were not prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles in the United States, including constant currency. In addition, the company reports comparable direct-to-consumer sales on a constant currency basis for operations that were open throughout the current and prior reporting periods. The company believes that these non-GAAP financial measures are important indicators of its operating performance because they exclude items that are unrelated to and may not be indicative of its core operating results. With that, I'll now turn it over to Dave. Thanks, Aaron. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm glad to be here today to discuss our strong start to fiscal year 2025. With this being my final call before I pass the torch to Stefano at the end of the month, I am confident that the Deckers team has laid the groundwork to deliver another year of excellent results as they build for the future of this amazing company. Specifically, Deckers' first quarter performance is highlighted by revenue growing 22% versus last year to $825 million, gross margin improving to 56.9%, and diluted earnings per share increasing 87% versus last year to $4.52. Importantly, this quarter's results were closely aligned with our objectives for fiscal year 2025, as HOCA was our main growth driver, increasing 30% versus last year to $545 million. UGG increased 14% versus last year as it continues to build year-round relevancy with consumers through iconic products. Both DDC and wholesale increased above 20% versus last year as our brands captured healthy demand across the global marketplace and international regions increased 21% versus last year, led by robust DDC growth. These incredible results, which include some unique benefits specific to the first quarter, give us confidence that we can deliver the increased profitability reflected in our updated outlook for full fiscal year 2025. 
Steve will provide further details on our updated outlook later in the call. But first, I will share some of the brand highlights from our first quarter before turning it over to our Chief Commercial Officer and incoming CEO, Stefano Carotti, to review channel performance. Starting with the brand highlights, global Hoka revenue in the first quarter increased 30% versus last year to a quarterly record of $545 million. Hoka performance was driven by the brand's compelling product assortment, including new launches, which experienced strong demand across the brand's global marketplace. More specifically, top styles like the Clifton and Bondi continued to experience healthy growth. Emerging franchises like the Mach, Transport, and Kiwana drove outsized gains, and new styles like the Skyward X, Cielo X1, and Skyflow brought incremental volume and attention to the brand through segmentation and greater innovation. Diving into our top styles, gateway products such as Clifton and Bondi remain the leading franchises for Hoka. The brand continues to build demand for these popular franchises through distribution segmentation as the introduction of model updates increasingly allow for differentiation of key partners to satisfy incremental demand and limited edition lifestyle treatments and collaborations that regularly sell out, offering unique versions of these hero styles. In terms of emerging Hoka franchises, I want to start by highlighting the Mach 6 launch, which has been a universal success. This redesigned and upgraded Mach has experienced strong sell-through across the global marketplace, resulting in the Mach being a top five revenue style for Hoka in Q1. Thus far, we are encouraged by the consumer adoption of the Mach, which is skewing younger and driving considerable acquisition in the U.S. and EMEA. We believe the expansive consumer demand we're seeing for the Mach is attributable to the fantastic work of the Hoka product and merchandising team, who designed the collection with color and branding variations that allow for greater differentiation across points of distribution. Regarding Transport and Kiwana, we continue to see these styles perform well on our DDC channel and with our Lifestyle Athletic Partners. Both styles saw explosive growth in the quarter, landing them in the Hoka brand's top 10 styles ranked by revenue. While the Transport and Kiwana were designed as a light hiker and fitness shoe, respectively, the consumer is increasingly adopting them for more casual and versatile wear. On the innovation front, the Hoka brand's most advanced performance-leading styles, the Cielo X1 and Skyward X, have far outperformed our expectations. These groundbreaking styles were featured as part of the Hoka Fly Lab experience, which was celebrated at worldwide events such as the Boston Marathon, Big Sur International Marathon, Hackney Half Marathon in London, and the Tokyo Marathon. The Skyward X in particular has been a key focus of our marketing efforts, as it reinforces the Hoka brand's origins and leadership position and max cushion performance. The success of innovative styles like the Cielo and Skyward is critical to Hoka maintaining its performance roots and emboldens the product team to continue pushing the envelope of our technologies. The Sky Flow, which only launched about 10 days ago, is also an all-new style focused on innovation, but at a much more commercial price point within the Hoka brand's product range. This exciting style, which combines premium Skyward X-inspired geometry with upgraded foam compounds, creating an elevated experience for daily runs. As part of our segmentation efforts, the Sky Flow is developed as a co-exclusive for our DDC and our run specialty partners continuing to elevate the Hoka brand's everyday performance lineup while differentiating its global marketplace. We are receiving great feedback from consumers and our retail partners in the early days of this launch. The strength of performance across the Hoka product lineup is amplified by the continued evolution of the brand's global marketplace. During the first quarter, Hoka drove balanced growth across channels, with DDC revenue increasing 33% versus last year and wholesale revenue increasing 28% versus last year. From a DDC perspective, Hoka continues to experience global gains through consumer acquisition and retention, with particular strength among retained consumers in the first quarter. We believe this is a powerful reflection of Hoka consumer loyalty, reinforcing the long runway we see for this brand and the reason we are focused on building the Hoka brand's awareness while there remains significant opportunity. Part of our approach to building Hoka brand awareness is through expanded points of distribution with key partners. During the quarter, we added strategic doors with select partners around the world, which contributed to Hoka wholesale growth in the quarter. We also continued adding shelf space and gaining market share as the brand refilled inventory in the channel and continued to see high levels of full price sell through. Outside of adding new distribution, Hoka is building awareness through its global marketing campaign. The latest chapter of the Hoka brand's Fly Human Fly campaign 
launched on July 1st with the new film Bird's Eye, which brings to life the brand's origin story and captures the exhilaration and joy of movement. The film is the centerpiece of a 360-degree integrated brand campaign inclusive of connected TV, out-of-home content, social and earned media, and in-person community activations in key cities. All of the elements of the Fly Human Fly campaign are aimed at deepening connections with consumers, inspiring brand love, and introducing new consumers to Hoka around the world. We are really proud of this elevated campaign, and I hope you all check out the Bird's Eye film when you have a chance. Overall, this quarter was an excellent start to the year for Hoka, with healthy full-price demand across global markets. The team is laser-focused on executing the brand strategy to build global brand awareness and market share with an enhanced focus on international markets, expand DDC through consumer acquisition and retention gains, and excite consumers with performance innovations. Shifting to UGG, global UGG revenue in the first quarter increased 14% versus last year to $223 million. Performance in the quarter was driven by strong full-price selling of key iconic franchises with increased year-round momentum, increased adoption of the expanding Golden Collection, continued momentum in global DDC, and robust wholesale growth in the U.S., reflecting earlier demand. We are encouraged by the consumer demand for UGG in the first quarter, as we believe it reflects continued progress in creating year-round excitement for the brand's versatile and seasonally relevant product. The UGG product team has done a fantastic job building product with purpose that is consumer-informed, champions UGG brand codes, and has increased wearing occasions, allowing the brand to build and sustain demand over longer periods of time. This is best evidenced by the continued year-round adoption of the Tazin franchise, as well as the growth being driven by an expanded golden collection. The UGG brand's ability to drive continued strong selling for the Tazin's franchise speaks to the power of its thoughtful management across the global marketplace, versatility of styling, and the marketing activations that preserve its relevance in the mind of our consumers. Specifically on the marketing front, UGG has collaborated with various brands and designers to create exclusive versions of Tasman franchise styles. During the first quarter, our upcoming Tasman collaboration with Chinese-born, London-based designer Feng Chen Wang was featured as part of her spring-summer 2025 collection unveiling at Paris Fashion Week. Her collection, and in particular the Tasman collaboration, was featured across influential fashion and cultural publications, including Vogue, Hypebeast, and High Snobriety. The UGG team's ability to maintain consumer interest through exciting marketing activations and collaborations is also benefiting newer franchises like the Golden Collection. The increase in consumer demand for this collection led to an expansion of silhouettes in the current year, which performed extremely well. Of the UGG brand's top 10 styles in the first quarter, ranked by revenue, four came from the Golden Collection, two of which were new to the brand this year. The Tasman franchise and Golden Collection were also key drivers of the UGG brand's DDC success in the first quarter, which was equally strong in the U.S. and international regions. The UGG brand's more focused assortment of relevant franchises is driving the majority of consumer demand, which contributed to lower promotion as compared to prior first quarters where the DDC business has historically been more influenced by end-of-season discounting on seasonal colors. While this dynamic is not expected to continue throughout fiscal year 2025, we do think it speaks to the strength of the brand and its ability to maintain year-round demand. UGG has exciting things ahead with the upcoming launch of its Feels Like UGG global marketing campaign, which features a dynamic group of creators who evoke the ethos of UGG. The Feels Like UGG campaign will come to life across the brand's global marketplace through social media, in-store events, and multi-sensory community activations that promote self-expression and a connected community. The brand is on track to deliver another year of healthy growth with premium products and elevated experiences that enhance our consumer connections. Both UGG and Hoka are off to strong starts in fiscal year 2025 and are well positioned to continue capturing high levels of consumer demand for the remainder of this year and beyond. Before passing off to Steve, I want to give Stefano an opportunity to review Decker's excellent channel performance in the first quarter. As all of you know, Stefano will be becoming Decker's next CEO on August 1st. I'm excited to welcome him today to speak on one of the areas he has been successfully leading for some time now in his current capacity as our Chief Commercial Officer. Stefano? Thanks, Dave. It's great to be here with you all today and share Decker's channel highlights within the global marketplace. 
Before diving in, I want to thank Dave for his thoughtful, enlightened leadership over the last eight years, and in particular, the mentorship provided over the last six months. Dave has been an extremely valuable resource for me throughout the transition, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to lead Deckers on our continued, exciting journey ahead. Diving into channel performance in the quarter, our results continue to reflect Decker's successful global marketplace management that has maintained a pull model of consumer demand, driving high levels of full price selling. This year, we signaled a much more balanced growth story between our DTC and wholesale channels, which was well executed in the first quarter. For the quarter, Global DTC increased 24% versus last year on a reported basis and 22% on a comparable basis. HOCA drove the majority of gains in the DTC channel, but we also saw positive contributions from the Ag brand. From a regional standpoint, DTC growth was robust across international regions and within the U.S., which increased 31% and 21% respectively. Among international regions, growth was most meaningful in China and EMEA, as both drove strong increases online and benefited from successful recent retail store openings. Regarding wholesale, global revenues increased 21% versus last year. Similar to DTC, Hoka drove the majority of the year-over-year volume gains, with similar strength in the U.S. and international regions. Ag growth was particularly strong in the U.S. as the brand continues to see earlier demand from wholesale partners and benefited from favorable year-over-year comparisons. Growth across Hoka and Ag was driven by full-price business as both brands delivered exceptional gross margins in the wholesale channel. The health of our balanced business across the global marketplace reflects both the demand for our brands and our team's outstanding channel management. Our brands are off to a great start to fiscal 25, and I look forward to sharing more with you next quarter. With that, I'll hand over to Steve to provide further details on our first quarter financial results, as well as our updated financial outlook for fiscal 25. Thanks, Stefano, and good afternoon, everyone. Deckers delivered strong results in the first quarter and demonstrated great progress towards our full fiscal year guidance, leading to increased profitability within our outlook that I'll cover shortly. As Dave outlined, HOCA was the main driver of growth in the quarter, delivering healthy gains in both the DTC and wholesale channels as the brand continues to build global awareness and market share. UGG delivered a solid quarter as the brand continued to see global demand in the DTC channel and increased its full price wholesale business in the U.S. As we continue to operate in a very dynamic consumer environment, we will remain nimble in our approach to managing the business for the long-term sustainable growth and executing against our strategic priorities. Our portfolio of leading brands continues to resonate with consumers, which positions us well in the global marketplace. With that, let's get into the detail of our first quarter fiscal year 2025 results. Revenue was $825 million, up 22% versus the prior year. Growth was primarily driven by Hoka as the brand increased 30% versus last year due to the exceptional demand experienced across the brand's global marketplace. Additionally, in the quarter, UGG increased 14%, primarily through wholesale gains as the brand continues to refill certain inventory in the marketplace. Gross margin for the quarter was 56.9%, which was up 560 basis points from last year's 51.3%. As compared to last year, first quarter gross margin primarily benefited from favorable brand and product mix as both our highest margin brand Hoka as well as higher margin products within UGG and Hoka drove a larger proportion of growth. Higher levels of full price selling particularly with the UGG brand, which was more promotional in the prior year first quarter, and lower freight rates recognized in this quarter, which are anticipated to be a headwind for the remainder of this year. SG&A dollar spend in the first quarter was $337 million, which is up 22% from last year's $276 million. 
as a percentage of revenue, SG&A was 40.9% versus 40.8% in the prior year. SG&A dollar growth compared to last year was driven by investment in key areas of the business in support of our growth initiatives, which include higher marketing spend, primarily related to expanding global HOCA awareness, and investments in talent to support key functions within our growing organization. Our tax rate was 22.5%, which compares to 21.9% in the prior year. These results, coupled with higher interest income and a lower share count as the result of our share repurchase program, drove diluted earnings per share of $4.52 for the quarter, which was $2.11 above last year's $2.41 per share, representing growth of 87%. Turning to our balance sheet, at June 30th, 2024, we ended June with $1.44 billion of cash and equivalents. Inventory was $753 million, up 2% versus the same point in time last year, and we had no outstanding borrowings. During the first quarter, we repurchased approximately $152 million worth of shares at an average price of $858.79. As of June 30, 2024, the company had approximately $790 million remaining under its stock repurchase authorization. Now, moving into our updated outlook for fiscal year 2025, we still expect total company revenue to grow approximately 10% versus last year to $4.7 billion, inclusive of HOCA, which is still expected to grow approximately 20%, and UGG, which is still expected to grow in the mid-single-digit range. We are increasing our gross margin, which is now expected to be approximately 54%, up 50 basis points from our prior guidance based on the strength of our first quarter result, which included near-term benefits that are not expected to repeat for the remainder of the fiscal year. As a reminder, our assumptions for the full fiscal year include a more normalized promotional environment with lower full price selling relative to the exceptional levels delivered in fiscal year 2024, and higher freight costs incurred and still experiencing related to the inventory brought in that will be expensed in the remainder of the year. SG&A is now expected to be in the range of 34% to 34.5% as we remain committed to investing in our key growth initiatives. Operating margin is now expected to be in the range of 19.5% to 20%. Our effective tax rate is still projected to be in the range of 22% to 23%. As a result of these changes, we are increasing our diluted earnings per share expectations to now be in the range of $29.75 to $30.65, representing a $0.65 increase on the high end. Please note, as mentioned in our release this afternoon, we have entered into an agreement to divest the Sanuk brand, which we expect to close in August 2024. As such, the ongoing Sanuk business has been removed from our forward-looking guidance. Further, this guidance excludes any unforeseen charges that may be considered non-recurring to our ongoing business or any impact from future share repurchases. Additionally, our guidance assumes no meaningful deterioration of current risks and uncertainties, which include but are not limited to changes in consumer confidence and recessionary pressures, inflationary pressures, fluctuation in foreign currency exchange rates, supply chain disruptions, and geopolitical tensions. In addition, as most of you may have seen, our board recently approved a six-for-one forward stock split of our outstanding capital stock which is pending stockholder approval at our 2024 annual meeting to be held on September 9th. The potential impact of the stock split is not reflected in our EPS guidance. Looking ahead, we remain confident in our ability to deliver the increased full fiscal year guidance as our disciplined operating model, in-demand global brands, 
and robust financial profile position us well to adapt to evolving marketplace dynamics. Before I hand the call back to Dave for his last time, I want to express my genuine appreciation for him. It has been a privilege and a pleasure working together for the last 12 years, especially the last eight years with him as our CEO. I am proud of all we have achieved together, building Deckers into an industry-leading company with an exciting future ahead. Dave, I wish you all the best in your retirement, and I look forward to working with you as a member of our board. Thanks, everyone. I'll now hand the call back to Dave for his final remarks. Thank you, Steve, for the kind words, and Stefano for your kind remarks earlier. I appreciate all you continue to do for the Deckers organization. Hogan UGG continue to excite and delight consumers with unique and innovative products that are driving increased demand. The momentum of these brands gives us confidence to achieve our updated guidance for the year. I believe Deckers is poised for long-term continued success. With the strength of these two powerful brands, a well-managed global marketplace, a focused and aligned management team, a disciplined approach to financial management, and engage employees who embrace a purpose-led culture. I am proud of the culture we have built within our organization and for Deckers being recognized externally as well as one of U.S. News and World Report's 2024 to 2025 best companies to work for and as one of Time Magazine's world's most sustainable companies of 2024. Before handing off to the operator, there are a few things I'd like to add. First, I want to sincerely thank Steve Fashing. Steve has been an amazing partner to me over the past eight years and has had a tremendous impact on Deckers and our success. Steve deserves to be recognized for his leadership and disciplined strategic approach to developing and maintaining our strong operating model and fortified balance sheet. We've been through a lot together, and I just want to say thank you, Steve. I also want to thank Aaron and Andy on our investor relations team. They have done an outstanding job preparing us for these quarterly calls and communicating Decker's strategy with all of you. It has been a pleasure working with them both. Thank you for all you've done and will continue to do at Deckers. I'm actually going to miss these earnings calls. Lastly, I want to express my gratitude for the final time. It has been the honor of a lifetime leading Deckers for the last eight years, and I am proud of all we accomplished together during this time. I want to thank all of our dedicated employees for making Deckers not only a successful company, but also an amazing place to work. We have proven that we are truly better together and that we can do a lot of good while doing great. Deckers is in excellent hands with Stefano and his leadership team. I have no doubt that he will do an exceptional job leading this organization and maintaining our great culture and strong results as he, along with our leadership team and all of our amazing employees, build the future of Deckers. One last time, on behalf of our management team, I want to thank everyone for listening and for your continued support. With that, I'll turn the call over to the operator for Q&A. Operator? Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad to raise your hand and join the queue. If you would like to withdraw your question, simply press star 1 again. We ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Your first question comes from the line of Jonathan Comp from Baird. Your line is open. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. And Dave, certainly not my Typical approach to say congratulations in this forum, but I think, you know, congratulations certainly are in order for just an incredible run here. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. And, and really, uh, to, to to turn to the business, I want to ask um, about the Hoka business, the momentum that you're seeing in light of, you know, frankly, mixed footwear data points in the industry, and then just Given the shape of the year, how you're planning, uh, still 20% growth for the year after you exceeded that to start, could you maybe just share a little bit more how you're planning you know, distribution and product launches as we think about the balance of the year? Yeah, good question. I think um, you know, I think it's it's important to just think of the context of this company. We're a global, multi-channel, multi-brand uh, business, and I think a little bit of data in a subset of that global business can. Uh, you know, can be misleading in some ways. So I think, I think our results speak for themselves in the past quarter, and uh, we're super confident um, in the remainder of the year. And uh, I'll let Stefano talk a little bit more about uh, where the business is going from here for the rest of the year. Yeah. Hey, John. Uh, you know, keep in mind we build brands for long-term health and sustainable growth. We just closed a great Q1, and we're confident in our full-year guidance. Uh, we are very happy with how. 
our brands are performing today. Uh, key product launches have been selling through very, very strongly. So our brands are strong and uh, in demand. So I don't anticipate uh, major issues for the balance of the year. Yeah, I think, John, this is Steve, just to kind of add on to that. As we think about the year, and it's what we discussed on the call last quarter in terms of how we saw the cadence of the year play out. We always said in percentage terms, right, that Q1 was going to be our strongest quarter. And as we came up against kind of more difficult comparisons from a year ago, those percentage rates would drop. And, you know, just to remind everybody, we are in control of this marketplace, right? And so we're being very careful and thoughtful about distribution, how we're growing wholesale, how we're growing DTC, how we keep that balance in place. And as we said, FY25 is going to be a year of wholesale growth. So we are expanding points of distribution, um, but we're keeping that right um, in mind as we think about that expanded distribution in light of the DTC. We also know that when we feed and bring in new customers through wholesale, we do see them migrate to our DTC. So again, this is part of our strategy. Um, and again, it's about that growth. And so we're not trying to do too much. Everything we do is to sustain the brands for long-term growth in the future. So I think that's what you're seeing play out. You know, I think the quarter was a great quarter, very much kind of in line, a little bit better than what we expected, but that's really how we see the, the year play out with the next few quarters. Yeah, and just to, to finish that off, I think, um, you know, our, our objective is to control the marketplace and the health of our brands, and we're obviously experiencing very high rates of full price sell through and, and, and healthy margins. And our goal is to continue that, uh, you know, continue our pull model in the marketplace for all of our brands, take opportunities where we can. Um, but we're not chasing numbers. We're, we're in this for the long game and looking for sustainable, healthy, profitable growth for years to come. That's very helpful. Just one follow up, if I could. Should, should we still be expecting uh, a new version of a Bondi? And um, maybe if you could comment at all on Clifton this fiscal year and any color or feedback on some of the new segmentation approach for some of your new uh, launches recently. Th thanks again. Yep. Yeah, John, good point. Uh, we've created a collection with styles and colors and branding variation that allows for greater differentiation across points of distribution. Um, uh, Mach 6 uh, has been performing super well. Uh, Bondi, the yeah, Bondi update uh, will hit uh, Q4, so it's a, a February launch. And then uh, we push back Clifton 10 uh, to fiscal 26 uh, to give uh, Bondi <coughs> Nine, sorry, no, Bondi eight, Bondi nine, uh, breathing room. And then the, I would also add the new Skyflow that recently just launched in the last couple of weeks um, is another opportunity for, you know, kind of a gateway issue for runners into the brand. Um, incredible innovation, but at more commercial price point um, that'll help round out that Clifton Bondi franchise. And so we're less reliant on those two. Those will still be, you know, super important. Um, you know, very, very strong sellers for us, but we think the Skyflow can add to that um, group of uh, key sellers, and uh, we'll see how that performs over the next 12 months, but so far the, the response to that's been very strong, and we're super pleased with that as well. That's great, and uh, Dave, best of luck with your transition. Thanks again. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Your next question comes from the line of Laurent Vasilescu from BNP Paribus. Your line is open. Oh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for taking my question. And Dave, again, congrats for all, for all you've done and, and for your future endeavors. Um, I wanted to ask about your your, um, your envious cash balance position of $1.4 billion. And obviously, there's going to be future cash generation. Dave, Stefano, this is also a question for you. And, and Steve, can you talk about your capital allocation priorities Clearly, buybacks are still important, but would you consider issuing a dividend at some point? Also, I don't think m and in the cards near term. I just wanted to be sure that's still the thought process going forward. Um, sure. Good question. Um, it is a healthy cash balance, so we're very proud of that. We built it over the last eight years. Um, I will speak to the M&A piece of it, then I'll hand it over to Steve on uh, dividends, et cetera. Um, M&A is something that, you know, our, our strategy hasn't changed here. We're, we're always looking, we're always exploring and evaluating opportunities. 
Um, and we keep coming back to the same answer, is that we have incredible organic growth with the brands we have um, for years to come, and we think we want to focus as much as we can on Hoka and UGG um, in reactivating Teba. You know, we have category expansion opportunities. We have men's opportunities in UGG, uh, apparel opportunity in Hoka over the years. And um, so I think given valuations out in the marketplace, given the um, integration challenges that it would cause on our end and potentially taking our eye off the ball, um, anything sizable is, is not on the radar right now. Uh, we just launched on new. We think that's got long-term potential. So um, no news really on the M&A, M&A front from a cash perspective. Steve? Yeah, and I think just to add to that a little bit, you know, with the growth rates that we're putting up too, you know, our focus really is on continued organic growth. Um, you know, and, and delivering exceptional levels of profitability. It's what's helping us at the same time build a, a strong balance sheet. And I think, you know, as I've said for some time, you know, we we like to operate with a position of strength and a strong balance sheet gives us that opportunity. To Dave's point, it gives us an opportunity to look what's around. But at the same time, and first and foremost, is about how we're investing in our business to continue to grow this over the long term. I think you've seen some of our step up in, in investment on the CapEx side. And then, as you know, Laurent, you know, we are committed. We don't guide to any future share repurchase, but you can see with the past, with what we delivered in Q1, there's definitely a commitment to share repurchase. And then to your question on dividends, sure. That's something that we always consider, and it's something that we discuss with our board of directors. So it's something that's on the table and, and being discussed, um, but nothing to announce at this stage. Okay. Thank you very much. And then the follow-up question uh, two parts for sort of follow-up question. Uh, I think Dave, you mentioned uh, the opportunities with with Hoka Apparel. Um, I saw that you launched Aerolite recently. It looks like it's doing very well. Um, just love to get your your take there. And then Steve, um, the guidance on the top line implies eight percent for the balance of the year. I know you've got the hardest comp in two Q. Last quarter, you did give us some commentary about one Q revenues. Anyway, I know you don't guide by quarter, but how do we think about the shape of the revenues for the remaining three quarters? Yeah, um, just real quick on the Hoka piece, uh, the new launch, uh, it's doing okay. You know, I think it's it's um, selling through well, small small units and limited distribution. Um, you know, I think one of, well, I know one of the key priorities for Robin and the team over the course of the next few years is to really um, create a compelling and exciting and innovative apparel offer. Um, we've yet to do that, quite honestly, um, and it's been okay to this point because we have such amazing footwear growth, but we know that, A, consumers want apparel from us, and, B, we have a tremendous opportunity to disrupt that category. Um, so consider that, uh, you know, a, a key priority of Robin and Stefano and the team, um, and we're investing in leadership and also um, – Infrastructure to be able to support those efforts over the years to come, but we, you know, it's early days still. Yeah, then, Laurent, on the guidance, it, you're right. We we don't give quarterly guidance. You know, I think as we've seen shifts in the business, we've seen revenue move. You know, as demonstrated in Q1 with the health of our brands and the in-demand nature of our brands, we are seeing uh, demand move a little bit earlier, which is why we saw Q1 stronger. We talked about that um, in kind of giving some direction on Q1. As we look out into the year, um, and with the guidance that we're holding from a revenue growth standpoint year over year at the 10%, the future quarters start to fall in line with that future or you know full year guidance that we've given on the year. So we expected Q1 to be our strongest percentage grower. Again, it's one of our smaller quarters. Um, as you stated, we know we're going to be up against um, harder comparisons against a year ago, and so that growth will slow down, but still delivering that top-line growth of around 10%. Okay, very helpful. Thank you very much, and best of luck, Dave, and to the team as well. Thanks, Laurent. Thanks, Laurent. Your next question comes from the line of Sam Poser from Williams Trading. Your line is open. Um, well, thank you guys for taking my questions. Um, Dave, I, I, I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. I believe, since I mentioned sand in all of my notes with you guys, that there's a little bit of sandbagging on you're really going to miss these earnings calls. I just feel that a little bit, but um, that's neither here nor there. I have three things. One, Aaron, the normal question, because the numbers didn't add up on the Hoka 
numbers. So if we can get the dollars for wholesale or dollars for direct by each brand for the quarter, that would be great. And then, um, Steve, the freight impact in the, like the freight impact you're anticipating for gross margin and the mix impact, which would both be geographic because you're expecting international growth to, I think, outpace domestic as well as channel. How will that impact the margins as well? Hi, Sam, it's Aaron. So I'll go ahead and kick off. Um, so for our first quarter results for global wholesale and distributor by brand, for UGG, it was approximately $143 million, HOCA, $333 million, Teva, $31.4 million, uh, and Sanook, $4.4 million. And that leaves you with other, which is predominantly Kulabura, um at $3.7 million. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Sam, and Steve, on the freight, you know, of the 560-ish basis point increase that we saw in Q1, 80 basis points of that was freight. So recall a year ago, um, we, we still had higher freight rates that came down throughout the year, um, and we still benefited from that in Q1. So that Q1 comparison was a freight benefit. As we move forward, and as I indicated in the prepared remarks, that now turns to a headwind, right? And, and what we think the full year impact of that freight will be is a negative uh, 80 bits. So the positive 80 now flips to a negative 80, and that negative balance is going to be incurred over the next three quarters. Okay. Okay. And then, and then as far as mix and channel? So in the quarter, uh, what we're saying of the 560, roughly about uh, 250 basis points from margin expansion and brand mix. So we saw an improvement um, in the brand proportion as well as some of the product mix that contributed to that uh, margin expansion. And then we had about 250 basis points of full price selling. So. Recall a year ago in Q1, we had more closeout business, um, and that's where we probably performed a little bit better, which is what you're seeing on the path through to the full year and the lift of the gross margin, um, is some of that better full price selling that we experienced and fewer closeout sales uh, in Q1 this year. And you're expecting things to normalize going forward from a mar from a promotional activity, which is sort of your cushion if things continue the way they are. Margins would be higher, I assume. Yeah. So look, and we'll we'll see how it plays out. But yes, and and that's what we said in our guidance. We anticipate it to be a more promotional environment um, going forward, and we'll see how things play out. Yeah. Thank you very much, and continued success. All right. Thanks, Sam. Our next question comes from a line of Dana Telsey from Telsey Advisory Group. Your line is open. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and congratulations, Dave. Wishing you best of luck on your next, and um, what, what a terrific accomplishment at Decker's and the, and the team that you've put in place to succeed. Um, Thanks, as Dana. you think about, as you think about the freight cost, Steve, what you were just saying, is there any difference in terms of what, what the exposure to China is? How are you thinking about that going forward? And what are you seeing in terms of pricing, both on the retail price front and what you're seeing in terms of raw materials? And then, Dave, on distribution for both HOCA and, and UGG, what are you seeing in new channels of distribution, new retail partners, and the expansion of any of those doors? Thank you. Okay, Dana, this is Steve. I'll start with the freight. So I think, you know, what we are – and we started to see it earlier in the year. What we benefited from in Q1 was rates on product that was kind of in place before we started to see these freight rate increases. And, and that's what we were able to benefit from in Q1. And recall the, the way we expense inventory and that freight which gets allocated to that inventory is when it sells through. So when we started to see the freight increases a few months ago, that's on the inventory that was inbound. That's what we're anticipating, um, you know, to sell through and therefore experience a higher rate. As you saw last year, rates declined during the year. So we're now anticipating rates increasing, um, and we've seen significant increases. We haven't necessarily 
assumed any further rate increases from the rates that are out there today. Um, so our assumptions are more around stabilization of freight rates uh, for the year, and we'll see. If it gets worse, that could be a headwind. If it gets better, it could be a little bit of a tailwind, but we're not seeing any indications of freight rates getting better at this point in time to be determined. Um, and then just in terms of input costs, um, we're not seeing, you know, and we're well bought kind of through the fall season, buying into spring season, not seeing too much change on the input costs at this stage, something that we're keeping a close eye on. Um, we have seen a little bit increase, but, but we're pretty much set for the year at this point. Yeah, and this is Dave. On the distribution side, you know, I think the teams are doing an, an ex exceptional job on managing the marketplace, you know, making sure that our current accounts are having healthy, you know, full price sell through with us and managing inventory levels appropriately. But at the same time, we are looking for other opportunities, uh, strategic growth, more so on the HOCA side. Um, you know, we have a, a store openings of our own that we'll be doing across UG and HOCA uh, globally. Um, you know, it's not rolling out massively, but we will be rolling out some new doors. We think that's important for both brands. Um, but I'll let Stefano speak to a little bit more specifics on which partners we're, we're working with on the HOCA side. Yeah, Dana, yes. We'll be um, seeing some expansion with key partners, both domestically and internationally. Uh, with the likes of uh, DSG, uh, JD, both in the U.S., uh, in Europe and Asia, uh, Intersport in Europe, uh, Foot Locker, um, as well as Top Sport in China, and Sport Check in Canada. And this is specific to Hoka. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Your next question comes from the line of Janine Stichter from BTIG. Your line is open. Hey, everyone. Uh, you've got Ethan on for Janine. Uh, my first question, just on the higher SG&A guide, could you give us a bit more color on where the spend is going and just philosophically how you think about investing revenue and margin upside into SG&A? Yeah, I think uh, I'll start this, Steve. You know, and what our thinking on that was with some margin expansion, it affords us an opportunity, you know, delivering still exceptional levels of profitability to continue to invest in building brands and, and global awareness of our brands. Right, and, and we see the competition, we see what's coming on. And so again, as we improve profitability, we can invest some of that back into continuing to build our brands and the awareness of our brands globally, and at the same time, pass some of it through uh, to lift our guidance. We think, again, this is a great long-term sustainable strategy of how we build our brands and the global awareness around it. Additionally, what's also included in there is, as we're growing at these rates, we have to build our teams um, and continue to invest in infrastructure that supports the continued growth of our business. So you're seeing, you know, continued step up um, in that respect. But again, you know, in line in percentage terms with what we've said um, with the revenue growth, and again, delivering exceptional levels, especially in comparison to our peers in the state. So. Um, you know, just a good good place to be and to take advantage of that when we're able to expand some of the gross margin. Yeah, and we'll, we're continuing to work within our own internal guardrails, you know, in our financial model, but given the opportunity and margin, we can be more flexible. And like we've said all along, we're going to continue to invest in these brands for growth. Um, but as we get bigger, especially in Hoka, it, you know, there's, there's more products to market. We just launched you know, a handful of brand new innovations to the marketplace, and they all need their uh, time in the sun, so to speak, and support from a marketing perspective, in addition to top of the funnel marketing to drive awareness globally. So um, it's going to good use, I can tell you that. Our marketing teams are exceptional at managing our marketing spend across the globe. Uh, we do that centrally with a, a very talented team, um, and we monitor the return on that spend, you know, almost daily. So. Um, we, we feel really confident that if we continue to invest in marketing in the right areas to promote the brand awareness and also individual launches, that's going to be uh, successful for us. And at the same time, you know, we're heading into a big season with UGG, and we have some exciting marketing activations that we need to get behind as well, and uh, we feel really confident about that spend going that way. Got it. That's all really helpful. And then just a follow-up from me, you know, for, you know, the wholesale growth you're talking about with Hoka driving it, just 
How much of that is going to be shelf space expansion or partners taking product earlier versus new door expansion? And just how should we think about the cadence of volume growth from new door openings for the rest of the year? Thank you. It's a combination of the two, um, both shelf space gain as well as uh, new doors. Yep. All right. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. Your next question comes from a line of Ike Burachow from Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Hey, guys. <clears throat> I just wanted a, a quick question on the, the Hoka DTC number. It, I mean, it's been strong for, for many years, but it's, it's, the, it's the first time it's, it's accelerated uh, in growth rate in, in about you know five quarters to 33%. Um, and it's doing it, I, I think you guys mentioned about the, the Clifton launch kind of being kicked out later. So with that acceleration with you know with the with Clifton kind of not benefiting you is it more the more Bondi is it more some of these newer launches like, like what exactly is driving that is there a certain region um that we could look to driving that it's just it's it's impressive to see especially with the timing of of, of the shifts we want to build a balanced business across more franchises and uh, recent launches of Caviota, Zarahis, Mark 6 um, uh, have been very successful. Uh, so we want to uh, build more legs to the Hoka store. Yeah, and I think these new launches in the last quarter, you know, the Cielo X and the Skyward, um, et cetera, you know, those really resonate on our DDC channels first. And, you know, and styles like that bring a lot of energy from our core loyal consumers. Uh, they can't wait to get the new product. Um, and then in addition to just the marketing efforts we're making across the board on awareness building and bringing new customers into the brand in general. So I think as Stefano said, as we build a balanced business across categories and franchises, um, this is an example of how that can benefit our business going forward. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing that we're watching closely is as we expand distribution and build brand awareness, we know customers come to us directly. Um, so the thing that we continue to watch is even as we're growing wholesale distribution, as consumers come into the brand, a way for them to find a broader offering is through our DTC experience. Um, and so here through DTC, they're able to experience a fuller line, plus we know we've engaged them. So they'll continue to buy through wholesale in many cases, but in some cases, they just want the product dropped at their doorstep. And so this is what we've talked about really for quarters, you know, a part of our strategy of how we balance that wholesale growth and combined with DTC and bringing customers in through DTC. Yeah. Super helpful. Thanks, Ike. Thanks, Ike. Your next question comes from a line of John Kernan from TD Cowan. Your line is open. Good afternoon. It's Krista. Zay. We're on for John. And, and Dave, we wish you all the best and, and congratulations on uh, your accomplishments at Deckers. Uh, two questions for us. First, on the inventory, sort of in total, it was up, you know, relatively low single digits. Kind of how would you ca characterize the inventory positioning, you know, across the channels for UGG, both domestic and internationally, and, and same for HOKA? And then just as a follow-up, can you provide some insight into the shape of the, your order book trends in relation to, you know, your comments around marketplace management and maintaining a pull market? I suspect they're likely running higher than your planned revenue guide uh, for fiscal 25. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I'll speak to the first one, and then I'll uh, hand it over to Steve, and he can handle the order book trends, which we don't generally give that information, but I'll, I'll see how Steve answers it for you. Um, but the inventory, yeah, up about approximately 2%. Uh, and specifically for UGG, we're feeling really, really good about our inventory position. I think you saw the, the success of um, Q1 with core styles like the Tasman and, and some of our franchise styles that do a lot of volume, but also the sell-through of the Golden Collection, both the Golden Star and the Golden Glow. Um, it's probably the best you know, sell-through uh, at top line and bottom line we've had of a spring sandal ever, and uh, we're super excited about that momentum. But it helps us go into fall with a very clean marketplace. Um, and we're in a good inventory position to be able to take care of the wholesale demand that we have and also funnel uh, our DDC engine um, with a tighter line, fewer SKUs, more inventory in the, in the top drivers of the assortment. Um, and I think that's going to continue to serve us well going forward. Steve? Yeah, I think, you know, just to add on the inventory too, that's something that we've been at work for a couple years now. And I think what you saw, especially coming out of the pandemic, is we were pretty aggressive in terms of getting inventory 
uh, in line, and I think we were, when I kind of looked across the space, one of the first ones really to get in a good position. I think, you know, from the balance that we're carrying, um, we feel really good. It's a good, healthy inventory position. We're not over-inventoried. It also allows us to get quick into the market, and so that's where you're able to, for us to move on innovation and move to new styles as being um, really disciplined on our inventory and inventory management. Um, on the order book, as Dave said, we don't comment on kind of order book levels, but um, what I will say is, you know, with the model that we run, the demand is greater than what we're supplying. Uh, and so that is our model, right, and it's working. And so if you talk to a number of our accounts, I think you would likely hear that they would probably want to buy more uh, than what we're allocating to them. And so from that perspective, I think we're in a good, healthy position um, as we look forward um, to the coming quarters. Thanks very much. You bet. Your next question comes from the line of Jason Soule from UBS, and this will be the last question. Your line is open. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, if we can just dig in on Hoka DTC a little bit more. Can you give us a sense of what the DTC growth rates were in, say, North America versus Europe? And if you're starting to see the Hoka brand really ramp in Asia, was that a contribute to the growth? Uh, that's my first question. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we haven't um, necessarily given the breakout of all that. But what we will say is that, you know, we're continuing to see strong international growth. Um, we're seeing good growth, uh, as demonstrated by the numbers um, in in North America as well. Um, all of that is contributing to the, the global lift that we did report. So I think, um, you know, what we believe in a lot of this is what we set out a couple years ago is the importance of building the international business. That's well on track. Yeah. Um, and what we are seeing is strong, kind of strong and building uh, awareness of the Hoka brand internationally that is contributing to DTC. It's also part of uh, a bit of our expansion within the wholesale channel. So Asia, is, it's more DTC still, but, you know, small numbers, but growing. Uh, and so that's something that we're continued to focus on. We have eyes kind of on the China market uh, and the opportunity there. And, and there you, you'll see us um, be more aggressive with like a retail build out. So we have more stores, Hoka stores in China than we do uh, any other country. So you know, I, I'd say well balanced in terms of the growth of how we've looked at it, uh, pleased with the progress that we're making, but, you know, a big focus of ours is growing that international component. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, I think it, it's we're, we're really pleased with the success of the DDC business over the last few years, and, you know, I'm excited by the level of repeat customers we're getting both in UGG and HOKA that are driving incremental gains in addition to new customers. Um, and then on the international front, you know, we have a long way to go, but we're off to a really good start in the last couple of years, particularly in Hoka with the growth of our online and store uh, distribution network in the international region and seeing good, healthy growth there. So as we've talked about, it's a priority for us. We want to get DDC to about 50% of our total business, potentially more uh, down the road um, because we gain all the data. We have a better relationship with our consumers. We're more engaged with them. Uh, and it's best for our margins um, and, and top-line um, ASP. So we'll continue to invest in this channel um, and leverage the pull model in wholesale and, and drive this to as high as it can be. But so far across the uh, marketplace globally, we're in really good shape. Got it. Well, Dave, if I can just do one follow-up. Um, that's a very interesting answer. And just given you know, the diversification of the UG line. And now you're talking about Skyflow mm -hmm. and Cielo and Skyward X, all the diversification in the Hoka line. And you're, it's a, yep. you know, you may start to open up stores in both brands, which I think the diverse product assortments are an unlock to that. Um, but it sounds yep. like you're only going to open up. What's the unlock? Uh, what's the gating factor to deciding that maybe it's time to roll out both UG and Hoka stores in a bigger way across the world? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. They're very different um, strategies. So in, in UGG, we're, we're really employing more of a city flagship low, uh, approach. And so we have Fifth Avenue in New York, which we opened uh, a few years ago. We have um, a new store that's opening in Knightsbridge in London. Um, we're looking for a flagship location, you know, similarly in, in Asia, in China. Um, we don't see us rolling out a lot of fleet doors for UGG. 
but more focused on you know exceptional experience and product uh, showcasing in these larger cities and larger formats. Hoka is a little bit different. You know, we just opened Fifth Avenue in New York, which is doing extremely well. Um, that's our biggest store ever, and we're learning a lot there. It's early days of Hoka retail, but. We see the demand, we see the opportunity, and we'll be a little bit more strategic and a little bit more aggressive, but we're not looking to roll out to 200 doors uh, across the fleet. We're going to manage this tightly along with the marketplace and make sure that we have you know, great experiences for our consumers. We are connecting with our local communities. Uh, we have opportunity for that. And then in big cities for our international consumers to experience the brand as well. So early days, it will be an investment, and um, that's why apparel is so important down the road for both brands. Um, to just kind of round out that overall assortment. But, um, you know, strategic, healthy, quality growth uh, across the globe and leveraging our partners in Asia where we can to do the same. Understood. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. And that concludes our question and answer session and does conclude today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>